I want to thank you guys for giving me feedback that you were having trouble hearing the audio on the last one. So here is the video with enhanced audio. Enjoy. Hey guys, this is Dana with the Wisdom Calls channel and what your pastor never told you dot com. And I'm actually coming to you today with a prophecy update. So this is some breaking news. As many of you know, uh, we are on the eve right now of Rosh Hashanah. And so they are celebrating the new year in Israel. They're getting ready to celebrate that. And this is something that just came across my Twitter feed. So excuse me, my Facebook feed. This is something that just came across my Facebook feed, and I had seen here that Yael Eckstein, who is someone that I follow in Israel, she is um, she's not a Christian, but she she is for the Fellowship of Jews and Christians, and so she works very closely with Christians, and so she's very friendly towards Christians, even though she's not yet a believer that Yeshua is the Messiah. Anyway, so she has some really great posts, um, and you can really learn a lot from you can really learn a lot from the Jewish perspective on this. So she posted this yesterday. The first red heifer has been born in Israel. So she says here, who is ready to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and greet Messiah? And she says me, you know, with all these exclamation points and um, celebratory markings here. And then there's a link here to this article from the Daily Star in the UK. And it says Bible prophecy fulfilled as the first red heifer born in 2000 years, signaling the end of days. So this is very interesting. And this is prophetic. And we're going to talk a little bit about why this is prophetic. So some of you may be saying, what in the world is this red heifer business? What is this all about? And it really goes back here to numbers 19. And it has to do with um, the cleansing of people so that they can be purified to enter into the temple. So without this uh, red heifer, as you'll see when we read through the, the law here in Numbers 19, there can be no cleansing of people when they come in contact with someone who has died. There's no cleansing for that um, apart from this provision with the red heifer. And so the thought being, the, the line of reasoning being that if a person cannot become cleansed after they've become in the same room with, you know, let's say you've been to a funeral or whatever, you've been in the same room with a dead person's body, you don't become clean unless you follow this ritual that the Lord laid out here in Numbers 19. And so without that, no one would be purified. No high priest could be purified. No one could enter into the third temple. And the Jewish thinking on this is that um, perhaps that the reason that no red heifer has been born in the past 2000 years is because it was not necessary. And so they um, are seeing this as a potential prophetic fulfillment that now that there is a totally pure red heifer born in Israel, that it could be a foreshadowing that the third temple is near. And so you saw that in Yale's post, but let's explore here a little bit in Numbers 19. It says, and then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, this is the statute of the law, which the Lord has commanded saying, speak to the sons of Israel that they bring to you, bring you an unblemished red heifer in which is no defect and on which no yoke or on which a yoke has never been placed. And so the the stipulation here is that this has to be a red heifer, in other words, a female cow that's completely red with no defect, no spot, no blemish, and it, on which no yoke has ever been placed. So if this um cow was ever used for manual labor in the field, you know, that type of thing, that it would be unqualified for this ritual cleansing. And it's actually used as a sacrificial animal to cleanse people. So it says, you'll give it to Eleazar the priest, and it shall be brought outside the camp and be slaughtered in his presence. Next, Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times. Then the red heifer shall be burned in his sight, and its hide and flesh and its blood with its refuse shall be burned. The priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet material and cast it into the midst of the burning heifer. The priest shall then wash his clothes and bathe, bathe his body in water and afterward come into the camp. But the priest shall be unclean until evening. So even after doing this ritual cleansing, he's still considered unclean until sunset, until the evening. The one who burns it shall also wash his clothes in water and bathe his body in water 
and shall be unclean until evening. Now a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place, and the congregation of the sons of Israel shall keep it shall keep it as water to remove impurity. It is purification from sin. Okay, so you're going to hear later that they, they mix these ashes apparently with water and that this is part of the ritual cleansing. And for whatever reason, the Lord has his reasons. He set these stipulations up and it says the one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening and it shall be a perpetual statute to the sons of israel and to the alien who sojourns among them so to the foreigners as well as to the sons of israel this is the people living in the land of israel this is what their responsibility is for cleansing the one who touches the corpse of any person shall be unclean for seven days that one shall purify himself from uncleanness with the water on the third day and on the seventh day and then he will be clean so you see anybody that comes in contact with someone who has died uh, is unclean until they have performed this ritual cleansing it says, but if he does not purify himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not be clean. Anyone who touches a corpse, the body of a man who has died and does not purify himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from Israel. So this is pretty severe. And you can imagine in those days, you know, you never know what causes a person to die. And those things could be spread. So the Lord had put these things in place that through this sacrificial offering, that would, that uncleanness would be covered or purified through this process. Because the water for impurity was not sprinkled on him, he shall be unclean and his uncleanness is still on him. And so you see here that anybody in Israel currently that's ever been in the same room or has touched a dead person, obviously that would be a corpse, they would be unclean and they would not be purified to go into a third temple if there were a third temple. And uh, verse 14 on continues to talk about, you know, if you're even on the same room with somebody that dies in a tent, you have to go through this process of ritual cleansing. Um, it says, but the man who is unclean and does not purify himself from uncleanness, that person shall be cut off from the midst of the assembly because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water for impurity has not been sprinkled on him. He is unclean. So it shall be a perpetual state for them. And he who sprinkles the water for impurity shall wash his clothes. And he who touches the water for impurity shall be unclean until even evening. Furthermore, Anything that is unclean, excuse me, furthermore, anything that the unclean person touches shall be unclean and the person who touches it shall be unclean until the evening. So why is this really important? Of course, this is important for when the temple is present. When the temple is a present, there are certain rules that apply in order for people to be considered clean to, to enter into the temple. And these are rules that the Lord had instated. And he says here that they were perpetual for the people in Israel to follow these commands. So now we have been talking about on this channel before that we know that the Lord will not return until after the third temple is built because certain things have to happen prior to Jesus's return. Jesus prophesied specific things that would happen before his return. And one of them being the abomination of desolation, which is the antichrist setting himself up in the third temple as though he is God. And until there is a third temple, that event will not happen. And the Lord won't come back until after that has happened. So I just want to go to that scripture really quick here. Now there's several scriptures that talk about this. Matthew 24 is a predominant one. And we talked about that in a recent video. Of course, it, for second Thessalonians chapter two, really important. This lays it out clear. Now we re we request you brethren with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. What's this talking about? It's talking about the Lord's return and our rapture that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by a spirit or by message or letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. 
So the Thessalonian church had been um, concerned that they had been left behind, so to speak, just like a lot of pre-tribbers had taught to hear um, all across the West that people had this potential of being left behind. The second Thessalonian church was afraid of this because things had gotten so bad. Their um, persecution had gotten so bad. They wondered if the day of the Lord had come and perhaps they had missed it. And so Paul is writing to them to, to assure them Uh, don't be shaken in mind at all or in spirit. Don't be disturbed by those things as though the day of the Lord has come because those things cannot come yet. And this is what he says, let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That's the falling away, people turning away from the faith and the man of lawlessness. Now this is referring to the antichrist is revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself to be God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things. So this was something that Paul preach to them over and over again. He says, don't you remember, we've had this conversation before. So eschatology to Paul is not something that's an afterthought or something that we don't need to bother with discussing. It's something that's really important. And so this is why I'm saying to you guys, we've been talking on this channel that you would hear people speculating on YouTube, on Facebook, all these different groups, wondering, is the rapture going to happen yet? Well, the rapture is linked to the Lord's return. It's also linked to the resurrection of the dead. And in Revelation, the resurrection of the dead does not happen until the very end, towards the very end of Revelation is when the resurrection of the dead happens. And and we see here that you have to have the abomination of desolation, which is the Antichrist setting himself up in the temple as God. And so now we have heightened expectations because Red Heifer has been born and they actually had a group of rabbinical experts go out and examine, like closely examine this heifer all the way around, because there have been other ones that were born that they thought would qualify. But after they inspected them closely, found out that they were um, disqualified for one reason or another, maybe they had some white hairs on them or a defect in some way, or even if they're male, it doesn't count, we need a heifer. So this one um, is apparently um, a red heifer. So we see here, it says that the red heifer was born on the 17th day of the month of Elul, which is August 28th of this year, 5,778, perfectly red heifer. She is a candidate for being um, cared for under the auspices of the Temple Institute, which they have a raise a red heifer in Israel program specifically for this so that they could have biblical purity and also that they would be ready for the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. And for those of you guys that don't know, I believe all the articles for the Third Temple have already been built. They've for, they've been training the priests for all of the duties they will be required to perform, and they are ready to go. So this thing could actually transpire very quickly. And what many of the Jews do not realize at this time, you know, they are expecting that Messiah will come when they have this third temple. But what will happen first is the anti-Messiah, the Antichrist will come. The one who is the ultimate false Christ will come and he will perform, he will have a false prophet performing signs and wonders and will deceive many. And after he sets himself up and sets up an idol to himself as God in the temple, then the abomination of desolation will have occurred. And at that time, a massive persecution of the Jews will happen. And that's why Jesus said, anyone who is in Jerusalem or Judea needs to flee to the mountains. And um, we see that in Matthew 24. So what's really interesting is that when you talk to Christians around the world, I think you would have this standard expectation that, yes, we are living in the last days. We are seeing biblical prophecy fulfilled in front of our eyes. In the Jewish Uh, community, we're seeing this heightened expectation that we are living in the last days and they are expecting the building of their third temple at some point in the very near future. So that's why we wanted to bring you these prophecy updates that are biblically relevant and just to have you seeing what's going on in front of our eyes. It's pretty incredible. The fact that it has been within the last hundred years that the majority of Israel has been brought back 
into the Holy Land. In fact, now I believe it is, I think in their most recent census, there are more Jews living in the land of Israel now than outside of the land. And that is historic as well. So we're going to keep an eye on Israel because Israel really is the timepiece for all of these things to happen. And Jesus actually said, look, I'm not going to come back to you again until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And so his return is incumbent upon them receiving him. And that will not happen until after the abomination of desolation, after the Antichrist has risen, and after the Jews have to flee Israel one final time. Um, there will be one more fleeing and Jesus prophesied that there would be an earthquake that will happen and that they will have to flee. There's prophecies that they will have to flee through this valley that the Lord will provide for them into the desert. And in Revelation 12, we read that the dragon who is Satan, when he has hurled the earth, he's going to pursue the woman who is Israel. But she is going to be kept in the wilderness, kept safe in the wilderness for a time, times and a half a time. So for a three and a half year period, she is going to be protected in the wilderness. And I believe it is that at that time that the Lord is going to woo Israel back to himself for one final time where she will finally become faithful Israel for the first time really in history. And at that time, we're going to see, I believe, the Lord's return and his entering into Jerusalem and the millennial reign will take place at that time. So lots of um, things to watch for, be looking for, but you have to know the scriptures. Otherwise, you don't understand the fulfillments that are going on in front of our eyes. So that's all I have for you today at the, for this prophecy update. Make sure to subscribe down below for future updates as well. And I will be talking to you guys real soon. Have a blessed day.